ओम ज्ञान चिमीरंधस्य ज्ञानं जनशलाकाय चक्षुरनीलितम् येन तस्मै श्री गुरवे नमः so this is bliss talking yeah, about <laughs> talking about Krishna in this way. Hare Krishna. Now I'll, by the grace of Lord Krishna, give a summary of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the beautiful, glorious description of the personality of Godhead, the topmost of all Puranas. Canto one, chapter eleven, Lord Krishna's entrance into Dwaraka following the translation and commentary of His Divine Grace Srila Prabhupada, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, which is uh, available for everyone, beautifully translated into English, and I recommend to everyone, keep a set, this is one of 18 volumes, keep a set in your home, and read it again and again and again. And in this way, our mind will be attracted to Krishna, just as the residents of Dwaraka, their mind is attracted to Krishna, which uh, we shall hear about in this chapter. Uh, in the previous chapter, it was described how Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, left Hastinapur and proceeded toward Dwaraka. And this chapter describes Lord Krishna's entrance into Dwaraka. When he reached near the border of that area, uh, of of the city of Dwaraka, Krishna sounded his concha. That's a sign that I'm coming. People can hear from a distance. And when the inhabitants of Dwaraka heard this, they became woke as if they were dead and coming to life. In other words, in the absence of Krishna, they were feeling quite miserable. Actually, not miserable because if we think of Krishna as they were doing all the time, then we always feel happy. But that is one kind of transcendental happiness. Thinking of Krishna in separation, thinking, when will Krishna come? When will Krishna come? They knew that Krishna was with Yudhishthira and the other Pandavas in Hastinapur. And they knew that Krishna was giving pleasure to those great devotees, but they also wanted that Krishna would come to them. So they were feeling dejected, Krishna is away, then they heard, they, they recognized the sound of his concha. Uh, Pancha Janya. Ah, it's just like, ah, now our life has come. Now we can feel happy again. Krishna has come. Krishna has come back. Ah. So the citizen Dwarka, having heard that sound, the sound of Krishna's uh, conch shell, apart from anything else, Krishna is the sup- as the Supreme Lord. He is the dispeller of all fear. They didn't feel any fear, but the, the, an analogy is given in Srimad Bhagavatam that the sound of that conch shell, that dispels all fear because wherever there is Krishna, there is victory. So in this material existence, it is typified by fear, Everyone is afraid of death. Everyone is afraid of so many uh, things. Loss of prestige, loss of money, loss of friends. Uh, but where there's Krishna, fear cannot remain. And when even the sound of his concha dispels all fear. So having heard, ah, oh, Krishna's, that means Krishna's return. And they all ran out to meet him uh, as fast as they could. There was so much desiring for such a long time to have the vision of Krishna. And now Krishna has come. The Krishna who is the great protector of his devotees. So everyone, they brought something to offer to Krishna. What can we offer to Krishna? Krishna gives everything. He gives everything in the world, but we can offer something to him just out of love. As Krishna famously says in Bhagavad Gita, Patrang pushpang palang tau yam yome bhaktya prayachati tadahang bhakti pahritam ashnami prayatatmana. Krishna says if a devotee offers him with pure devotion, a leaf, flower, fruit, or water, I will accept it. So the citizens of Dwaraka, they all brought something to offer to Krishna, just as a token of their great love for him. Even though 
again, he doesn't need anything. He's fully satisfied. He doesn't need anything from anyone. He doesn't need a leaf of flower, fruit or water, or even piles of gold. He doesn't need anything from anyone. He's fully self-satisfied. He's fully self-sufficient. He can, If we want to offer Chris a room full of gold, he, he can give us a whole building full of gold. But what he's really looking for is the love in our hearts, and he very much appreciates that. So it's uh, the example is given in Bhagavatam. In one sense, it's like offering a lamp to the sun. Now, if we hold up a little lamp, or in the modern age, a torch or a flashlight, that can do nothing to help us see the sun because the, the light of the of the lamp is insignificant, infinitesimal in comparison with, to that of the seemingly infinite light and energy of the power of the sun. But again, because Krishna is very kind, he appreciates and accepts the offerings of his devotees, even though there's no way we can actually benefit Krishna by giving anything to Krishna. So the citizens of Dwaraka began to speak in their great ecstasy. They spoke to receive Krishna uh, just, but although they knew Krishna is God, the Supreme Lord, they also had the relationship with him of being sons uh, and some, all, all different kinds of relationships with Krishna. They saw Krishna as their great protector. Even now, of course, Krishna is known as Dwaraka Dish, the Lord of Dwaraka. He is worshipped in that form in Dwaraka, Dwaraka Dish. So they, their relationship with Krishna, in general, the citizens of Dwarka, are very intimate, and they see him as their great protector. So uh, some of the things they said are recorded here in Srimad Bhagavatam. They said that you are worshipped by all the great demigods, and even by Lord Brahma, the first living being within this universe. Uh, what to speak of Indra, the king of heaven, and the four sanas, that means the great... Uh, they're just giving some names. It means he's worshipped by all great personalities, by all great sages and holy persons, and by all demigods. Yang Brahma, Varanendra, Rudra, Maruta, Stundanti, Divyai, Stavai. Elsewhere it's stated that all... Giving the names of several of the most famous demigods, they all worship him by uh, transcendental prayers. Uh, Krishna is the ultimate goal for people who are seeking the highest goal of life. Everyone should seek the highest goal of life. What is what is the ultimate? We shouldn't be satisfied with our miserable little lives in this miserable little world. We should pursue the ultimate. What is the highest? And people try to do that in various ways by meditation or by worshipping the Lord or trying to find out who is God. But this quest to find what is the ultimate truth, what is the highest reality, this quest comes to an end in Krishna because Krishna is the highest reality. So if we're seeking the ultimate truth, we can seek and seek and seek, maybe after going over many, many lives. But when we find Krishna and we take full shelter in Krishna, then we no longer have to seek the truth for we have found the truth. So Krishna is the ultimate refuge for all transcendentalists, for all people who are really aspiring to achieve the highest benefit of life. Krishna is the supreme transcendental Lord. He is beyond even time. Uh, Time cannot affect him. We are all affected by time. That means that we grow old, we have to die. Krishna does not grow old. He doesn't have to die. We don't speak of Krishna's death. That's not correct. Krishna appears in this world by his own desire and he leaves this world by his own desire. So the residents of Dwarka were quite aware of this and they addressed Krishna thus. They they, they addressed him as the creator of the universe. You are are just like our father and mother. Krishna is everything to the devotees. The greatest well-wisher, the greatest master, the greatest guru, and the greatest object of worship. This is Krishna. What beautiful prayers. Uh, 
by taking shelter of you, the residents of Dwarka. They said, our life is successful and perfect in all respect. So that's true for us also. Here, on this planet, in this present day, if we simply take shelter of Krishna, our life will be perfect in all respect. And then we'll be completely fulfilled, we'll be completely satisfied. <clears throat> so they prayed, the citizens of Dwarka, they prayed that you continue to bless us with your mercy. Even if we attain Krishna, we shouldn't think, well, okay, that's all over now. I, now I'm Krishna conscious. No, we always have to pray for Krishna's mercy. That is the uh, exchange of devotion. We don't think, now I captured Krishna. Now I'm God-realized. The devotee is always very humble and realistically realizes that I have no power, nothing of my own. I'm at every moment, in every way, completely dependent on the mercy of Krishna. So the citizens of Dwarka prayed like that. Please continue to uh, give us your mercy. We want your mercy. Ah, they, they said that it is our great good fortune that you have come again. We're now we've, we know that we're always protected by you, but we, we can experience that very directly when you're right in front of us. Uh, Krishna always protects his devotees. At the same time, the devotees, they, they actually want to be with Krishna. Yes. In the residents of Dwarka, that is their relationship with Krishna, to always live under his protection. Uh, Krishna lives in Dwarka. He rarely even goes to the heavenly planets. He prefers to live with his devotees in Dwarka. So they were very happy that Krishna, sometimes he goes off to on different errands, Although he has nothing to do, but to please his devotees, he goes sometimes to Hastinapur, sometimes to Mathura. But the inhabitants of Dwarka, although they understand that Krishna has to do that, but when he goes away, they feel that every moment is like a million years, millions of years, feeling separation from Krishna. When we're in an uh, unhappy situation, time goes, seems to go very slowly. So even one moment they would feel, even a moment seems like a long, long time. But now they said, now that you've come back, Krishna, ah, now we can see you. Now we can be with you. Now we can actually be happy again. Otherwise, what is the use even of our eyes? So the residents of Dwarka, they felt as if their eyes were useless without seeing Krishna. As if there was... Just like if there's no sunlight, then you're, if there's no light, you can't see. So they felt that without Krishna, what's the use of our eyes? Uh, so <clears throat> Dwaraka city is described uh, that it was protected by the inhabitants, uh, especially the uh, descendants of Vrishni. Uh, they were the sub-protectors under Krishna. The city of Dwaraka is described not like modern cities. People try to make cities nice by putting some parks, but generally cities in the modern age are polluted and they may have factories. And people are not very happy, but in Dwarka there are many beautiful gardens and orchards and ashrams for the saintly uh, brahmanas to live in. Uh, very beautiful in all respects. Reservoirs of water. So we also, when we make cities, we try to make it nice like that, but Dwarka with, and when Krishna was living there was the paragon of all beautiful cities. All the residences were uh, very beautiful, uh, all filled with valuable uh, materials, made out of material. This, the gateways to the city, uh, they were all decorated, especially when Krishna was coming, so it's very auspicious. Uh, the the uh, gateways and the roads were decorated with banana trees, and uh, mango leaves. We'll see the same culture in India even today. When a respectable person comes, or a great sadhu comes, or, uh, then they'll make the same kind of arrangement with festoons and flowers and mango leaves and banana trees. The same culture is going on now as even then. Uh, all the highways and the, the, the roads and the public meeting places, they were all 
thoroughly cleansed for Krishna to come. Of course, they'd be cleansed regularly, but a special cleaning was done and then sprinkled with scented water so that the whole atmosphere in the whole city uh, smelled very pleasant. And fruits, flowers, and this akshata, unbroken rice, it was sprinkled everywhere to make a pleasing and auspicious atmosphere. Outside every every door of every residence, uh, clay pots with coconuts on them, and uh, items like... Uh, Oh, another thing put is the sugar cane that is put outside, and yogurt. Yeah, yogurt may be sprinkled here and there, and then incense and uh, oil lamps. All these auspicious items were placed to welcome Krishna, the supreme personality of Godhead. Everyone, uh, as soon as they heard that Krishna was coming, uh, all the, the leaders of the Yadu dynasty and everyone. They all, whatever they were doing, they stopped and they they just forgot whatever, even if they were eating or resting or lying at conversing with others, they immediately forgot what they were doing and prepared to receive the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. The leaders of the Yadu dynasty, they went out on chariots as fast as they could to greet the Lord. They brought with them brahmanas who were reciting Vedic hymns they had all kinds of auspicious offerings uh, to offer to Krishna. Uh, elephants who were also considered very auspicious, they also accompanied them as they went to meet Krishna. And then the auspicious sound of conch shells blowing and bugles blowing. It was all of a sudden there was a big festival going on. Krishna has come! We can't imagine what is the happiness of the residents of Dwarka. That at last they knew that Krishna is going to come but it seemed a long time. When every day they would get up and say, when will Krishna come today? Will Krishna come today? And every moment, Krishna could come at any moment. They were thinking like that. And eventually Krishna came. And all their anxiety, of all their hope, Krishna, Krishna, when will he come? It all dispelled and they felt full happiness in the return of Krishna. So they offered their respectful prayers, but it wasn't just with respect, it was with full affection and love. The residents of Dwaraka, like the residents of Hastinapur, they understood that Krishna is the Supreme Lord, but at the same time they had a very personal, affectionate relationship with him. So it's greeting him as is fit for the Supreme Lord, but with their own personal love for him also, real love. God is not simply to be prayed to and respected and bowed down to, but actually loved. And Krishna, he plays the part of a human being just to accept the love of his devotees. Now, uh, one thing that might be very surprising is that Krishna, uh, so even if by fate one may be in some unfortunate position, some position which is not considered very respectable by society. Even then, one can be a devotee of Krishna. Devotion is required. Uh, so, uh, apart from, it, it, description is given. All different kinds of people came out of the city. Entertainers, people who were uh, trained in uh, offering prayers uh, to kings, Panegyrists is the technical term. Uh, musicians, the singers, they all came out to greet Krishna. Uh, and they, the, the entertainers, they would perform uh, some dramas of Krishna's superhuman pastimes, the uh, professional glorifiers, which kings would keep in their court. They would glorify the transcendental pastimes of Krishna. Uh, Krishna, just as they were going out to meet him, Krishna himself was also advancing toward them. And Krishna very happily met all the leading citizens of Dwarka outside the city and uh, embraced them, offered them greetings to the elders. He bowed down, smiling, and in all respects made them happy. And it's mentioned that not only did he greet the leaders, the, the prominent people of Dwarka, but also even the persons who are considered lowest in rank. 
It's not that one has to be a very highly placed person to please Krishna. One can be in any social status. Uh, Krishna is pleased by devotion. So even persons, we don't expect persons of very low rank. If a king comes to the city, we don't expect the king to acknowledge the persons of low rank. But Krishna did because he really loves everyone very deeply. Then Krishna entered the city and around him were the people of higher rank, the uh, elderly people, elders are to be respected, uh, the brahmanas, the, the leaders of society, uh, they entered the city along with their wives, along with Krishna, and they were all praising the glories of Lord Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The ladies went up onto the roofs, and from there they glorified Krishna. They did some distance. They should keep a little distance. That is Vedic culture, that men and women don't just mix up very freely. Uh, and they, but by seeing Krishna, they're fully satisfied, and they consider this is like the, the greatest festival that could ever be, just to see Krishna coming into Dwaraka. They, the inhabitants of Dwaraka, they regularly saw the Lord. Of course, he'd been away for some time now, but even though they saw him every day, it wasn't a case of familiarity breeds contempt. Every day they saw him and every day they experienced extreme transcendental bliss and they wanted to see him more and more and more and more, the reservoir of all beauty, the reservoir of all pleasure, the reservoir of all attractiveness, the supreme, beautiful, loving, most kind personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, who resides in Dwaraka. His very chest is the abode of the goddess of fortune. There's all good fortune is there with Krishna. His <clears throat> moon-like face is the proper object for the eyes that desire to see all that is beautiful. This is the poetic language of the Bhagavatam. His arms are the resting place for the administrative demigods and his lotus feet are the refuge for the pure devotees who never desire anything else or to never desire to talk about or glorify anyone than Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead. As he uh, entered along the public road of Dwarka, the umbrella was held over his head both ceremoniously and uh, as a mark of respect. And there's a description of him. Uh, he's just like uh, the, the sun and the, all the beautiful things that we can see when the sun is next to a cloud or when there are rainbows, whatever descriptions, whatever beautiful things, they were all uh, eclipsed by the superlative beauty of Krishna. So uh, Krishna entered the house of Vasudev, his father in Dwarka. He was embraced by all his mothers who were present there along with Devaki, her six sisters who were all wives of Vasudev. And from their breasts sprung milk, even though they were older women, but out of affection, even though Krishna himself was married, but out of maternal affection, milk appeared in their breasts and their eyes were wet with tears of love for the Lord. And then Krishna entered into his own palaces, 16,108 palaces, expanding himself into 16,108 forms. And his wives, out of some shyness, didn't immediately personally go to greet him, but they sent their sons and Krishna embraced his sons and his wives were very satisfied to see that. Uh, so the, the queens of Krishna, it's described, they were the most beautiful women. I, I, we shouldn't say the most beautiful women imaginable because we can't imagine how beautiful they were, fully transcendentally beautiful in all respects. And they thought that they had Krishna under their control. They thought that, oh, Krishna, he's with us all the time, just like an ordinary woman might think about her husband. But actually, Krishna, although he played uh, the role of being something like a, uh, a henpecked husband, uh, he would uh, satisfy his wives in all respects and be with them and be with them all the time. Each queen thought, Krishna's with me all the time, but actually he's with all the queens all the time. <laughs> but they thought, I'm the, I, I'm 
with Krishna all the time. I'm so fortunate Krishna is with me. So it appears that Krishna was in many respects like an ordinary husband, but uh, there's one very important verse, just the penultimate verse of this chapter, uh, which states like this, Etad ishanam ishasya prakriti sto pitad gunai. Now, yujjate sadatma staryata buddhistadashaya. That this is the godliness of God. What makes him God? How is he God? What, what do we mean when we say that Krishna is God? Well, this is one major symptom. Even though he appears in this material world, he's not affected by the material conditions. Even if he appears to be so, he's always the supreme controller. He's always aloof from the material modes. And that is true of his devotees also. This is a very important point. So please study this Srimad Bhagavatam and understand everything about